All right, everyone, so we're ready to start again. Uh, this last session is going to be on uh, basically modeling of epilepsy and across different scales and also some considerations of group theory and control theory, I think. And our first speaker is Bill Stacey from the University of Michigan. So thanks, Bill. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to warn you all that I'm going to say a lot of things that I don't necessarily believe. But these are things that have to be said in the context of uh, the keys and challenges of modeling epilepsy. Specifically, what I'm going to be talking about is a very general talk. How you can write papers and grants with modeling in them. This is an audience that I think that's of interest to many of us. So first, a disclosure, a uh, disclosure of my past history. So i have just now finishing my first grant, uh, which is a modeling-only grant. And the process of getting that grant convinced me that I would never do modeling again. Uh, I'm an author of several modeling-only papers. And uh, these, these are actually real figures. So one of the papers, I had 90 questions to answer from one of the reviewers. That, that's the actual number. And on another one, uh, I submitted a paper to a journal and waited five weeks for the editors to say, no, we're not going to send it to reviewers, which was excellent. Uh, and then most of all, that of all of these modeling-only papers, none of you have probably read them. So that tells you something. On the other hand, I'm just now going to be starting another grant that has modeling in it. Now, the modeling this time is one piece of 1A, which is kind of telling. I only put it in there because one of the people that's on the grant with me basically begged me, why aren't you putting modeling in the grant? And my last two papers were modeling. And uh, some of you actually, one of these papers has actually been talk, talked about already today. So not completely uh, bad news, but there is a lot of bad news. First, just a little exercise. I'd like each of you to think of all the modeling papers that you know. Just kind of a tally in your mind. Or how many modeling people can you think of? So how many, how, just think of a number. I'm not going to, not really have time to, to go through this. Think of how many people you remember. It's probably not all that many. Of the ones that you remember, what is it that you remember? Usually they are models that describe a what, a how, or a why. Something interesting. You remember a specific detail about the model that they did. What you don't remember is that they made a model of something. So it's not interesting that somebody modeled a seizure. It is interesting if they model a seizure in a way that's interesting or if they answer some question. And that is one of the main fallacies that I'll talk about. It's very tempting as a modeler to just do something because you can. And that's just not good enough. Epilepsy is very risky. It's something that people don't understand. And so it seems to be a perfect situation to model. But the problem is, because we don't understand it, we're stuck in a situation where we really don't have a way of validating anything that we say. And people just don't believe us when we make a model. And they're probably right. When you model something in epilepsy, especially, you have to have a purpose. And you have to be ready once you say, I am modeling X disease, you have to be ready for the fact that one of your viewers might be an expert in X disease and not in modeling. And they're going to be very scrutinous of what you're saying. And they're going to be somewhat offended at what you're saying if you're not backing it up with experimental evidence. So basically, modeling seizures is inviting disaster, is the pessimistic way of saying it. Many challenges with modeling. So physiologists don't believe you when you say you're modeling seizures. The modelers don't like your model. The editors are worried that it won't be cited, and they're 
probably right. Reviewers are easily offended, and you're always in for a battle. So since I'm in Australia, I decided to find a, an Australian version. Actually, this is, I'll say it's more of a Pan-Pacific version of the process in which we review papers for Marlon. All Blacks, 2009. Do I need to stop? It's the, it's the... This is uh, known as testosterone incarnate. But, uh, so that's the Hakka dance yelling at each other, challenging each other. And those of you that have been trying to write, maybe that works for all papers, but uh, you're always in for a battle, especially with, with uh, modeling papers. So these are actually, they're going to be a bunch of real quotes for real modelers. I'm not going to tell you who they are. Some of you may be able to guess who some of the people are. Uh, it's amazing how well these quotes match each of the people that they are connected to. So I, I collected the usual suspects of experts, and these are quotes that I've heard throughout my life telling me how to model. I would never try to do what you are doing. <laughs> I was talking about making a project with just modeling. So there's, just to start off, there's two main problems with models, and they're very related to each other. One of them is the black box problem. The other one is perfectly described by a paper by uh, Astrid Prince and Eve Martyr. We like black boxes and engineers and physicists. They're offensive to physiologists. And the problem is that you package something in a model. You can do anything you want. You can create any output you want with a model. A reviewer is not going to read your code. They're not going to test your code. And so unless you are explicit in the way that you're describing something, if you give them a black box, and don't describe the process that goes through there, they're not going to trust what you say. Going along with this is this uh, idea that Astrid and Eve Marner put out, which is they took a very simple model of just three cells, and they wanted to produce the stomatogastric ganglion output of a lobster. And they found that there were essentially infinite solutions that can produce the single output that they were looking at. And this has turned out to be very robust. And it is very robust in normal physiology. Humans have adapted several different ways, for instance, to, uh, to high altitude. There's more than one way that humans react to that. Two completely different answers that give exactly the same response. And in modeling, you've got that problem. The more parameters you have, the more likely it is that the parameter set that you find that you think is important is just one of perhaps an infinite number of solutions. And how are you going to be able to describe that yours is better than another? The reviewer will say, this is just specific to this model and has no physiological re relevance. And they're right. Next quote. This is, since I start off with a bad one, I'll start off with a good one. This is exactly what I see in my data. And then a year later, how should I do my next experiment? That moment, I felt, this is a fairly famous painting of the Oracle at Delphi. I felt like the Oracle at Delphi, where this person would come up to me and say, tell me what to do. And this model worked very well. It helped guide some physiological experiments. So my first piece of advice on the good side is do something useful with your model. Pick a real problem a real need and make a real prediction and maybe you can produce the perfect impossible experiment. Once you've done it though, you can't simply title your paper a computational model of 
you've already lost the audience. So a computational model of blank is not interesting. Telling me that you've figured out the mechanisms of blank is. Why do you need a complex model? So in this case, I thought the answer was to make a very physiological model, a la Roger Traub's type model. I'll talk more about him later on. Uh, but in this uh, mentor to me uh, suggested that sometimes you need a less complex model because you are modeling things that you want to be generic. So we need to think broadly, going back to Astrid Prince's paper here, are we dealing with parameters that are robust? Are they conserved across different models? What are the weaknesses of your model? And you've got this balance between something that's very generic that might describe something generically versus taking something that is physiologically relevant. If you go too far to the generic side, you're just making a bunch of equations that have no meaning. If you go too far to the uh, physiological side, you're modeling just one specific set of parameters, which doesn't generalize to anything. And as you're doing so, you have to be willing to doubt your own model. And this is from a paper that we just published. And uh, just as a very quick anecdote, we were trying to model uh, high-frequency oscillations and found during one of the parameter sweeps that even when we removed all of the coupling, it still made high-frequency oscillations. And that didn't make any sense. And the, the postdoc that was working on it with me explained it to me. And I said, he said, you've made a mistake in your model. Go back and fix it. He did it. He tried everything he could. And he could not get it to stop oscillating. No coupling at all in the model. And so my next thought was, well, it can only be attributed to human error. And this is a quote from HAL 9000. So we had to doubt the model and change the situation completely. It's like, we can't control everything that's going on in this model. Let's go to something that we can control and see if this is actually what's going on. And it turned out that it seemed like it was going on. So we convinced ourselves that then we had to figure out what to do with it. Which brings me to the next quote. I've never had a problem getting other people interested in modeling. The model could explain things that the experiments could not. Sometimes you can hit something right on the head. And what we had figured out in this case was it actually is an inherent property. If you have a bunch of cells that are firing at near the same frequency, it doesn't matter whether they're coupled or not. By signal processing, by basic signal processing, they actually will produce a coherent oscillation. Sounds a little bit strange. And so to describe it, we made this a uh, bunch of equations. Uh, these equations don't work in certain journals. If you want to send modeling papers, if you want to get these out to physiology type people, putting this in the journal article, this is not their language. This is actually pretty simple to pe most people in the audience. So we've got you know, just a summation, a bunch of Dirac delta functions. We're doing a convolution of those Dirac deltas with a template producing a bunch of things. You've lost a lot of the audience there. Now, this still has to be there, but you're going to have trouble convincing them of it unless you do something like this. So you have to make a pretty picture and describe what you are doing and keep it simple. In this case, we were trying to produce, through just a random sequence of direct delta functions, we convolved them with this template of the output of either action potentials or a postsynaptic potential, and proved that we actually could produce coherent oscillations with completely uncoupled neurons. In this case, we knew what was going on completely, and so we knew that, that it, was going, it was doing what we thought it was. And then we decided to make an even prettier picture, which looks nice. We showed what the oscillation looks like. We don't always do this in modeling, but this is the type of thing. If you can make a nice, pretty picture and show someone what it is that you're trying to do, it is a very powerful way to convince people what you're doing. 
We've been looking for evidence of this prediction for the past 15 years. Sometimes you need to be willing to move on. This is a set of equations that was going to be in that paper we just published. And this set of equations was inappropriate for the audience. And the editor wrote to us and said, the analytical slash math section is still an issue. A better fit would be in a theoretical journal to study. We would need feedback from a theoretician. I would suggest removing this part. Gone. Okay, that took a lot of work. So what, what uh, Chris Fink had done in this case is he had analytically derived the statement that I said before that you can take a bunch of cells that are completely uncoupled and produce a coherent oscillation. Many of you in the audience may think that what I said is a little ridiculous. But this equation actually, this, these equations actually prove it. It's not in the paper. It's not in the paper because it just wasn't going to be, wasn't going to fit. You had to be willing to take it out. On the good side, I suggest a model sandwich. And this is probably the most important thing I can say today, anybody that's interested in modeling. The normal process in which we think about modeling is you, you come up with an idea, you model it, and then if you want to get it into a high-end journal, you find some type of experiment to try to validate the model that you've done. That often works, but what the most effective modelers try to do is a little bit different. When they present it, they do it a little differently. They don't say, we made this model, and then we proved the model. If you just take half of that proof and change your story a little bit, we made this observation. We decided to describe it in the model. The model made some predictions, and then we went back and tested some of these predictions. A model sandwich. You sandwich your physiological data on either side, of the model. That is a, a very good way of getting things into high-end journals. And a great example of that is Fabrice Wendler. So he has done a lot of modeling in neural mass models, which are kind of on the, the low-end scale of, of detail. But he's gotten these into high-end neurology journals, such as Annals of Neurology. And he's done it by sandwiching around uh, physiological data. I don't care about the physiology versus are those parameters physiologically relevant. The yin and yang of modeling, finding this right balance. Sometimes you have to be really careful and make sure that people don't think that you're cheating. This is uh, an example from our recent paper. We wanted to describe the difference between the local field potential seen by action potentials versus those seen by uh, postsynaptic potentials, but to do that, you have to model a bunch of cells that receive these postsynaptic potentials because they're very small. So within the model, we just call those satellite cells. That offended reviewers because it seemed like we were cheating. So again, at the advice of the editor, we just decided to call them additional parameter cells. Simply by changing the name, calling it something else, it no longer looks like we, we weren't cheating. But by giving it different names, it seemed like we were adding things to the model. <clears throat> Choose the right journal. Now this, uh, I've got a lot of data here. This, this is what uh, took me more time than anything else in this paper. Fabrice, uh, who wanted to be here, as soon as he found out I was giving this talk, he said, you need to look at my paper that's just coming out. I actually don't know if it's, it's technically been printed yet. He did a review of computational models of epileptic activity. And in this review, I decided to go through every source and analyze the, uh, the metrics of all these sources. So what I did, he has gone through, this is the most recent review article we have on computational modeling. I found where the citations came from, what type of modeling it was, and how many citations per year. And this is our distribution, 172 journals. Citations per year, 48 of them have never been cited. And looking at these, you can see the distribution is very spread out. 
The mean, 6.6, .6, not that great, but that mean is severely influenced by Hodgkin and Huxley, way up there at 105. <laughs> Bartos, uh, that's a very cited, very highly cited paper, and then Wang and Buzaki, 1996. Take those away, and the mean drops down significantly. So I think the median is a much better way of looking at these papers. So splitting these up, Detailed models, these are models that talk about specific neural parameters, trying to build neurons. The median here is 3.4, and the, the mean was highly influenced by Hodgkin Huxley and then Astrid Prince's model we talked about before. Most of them below 20 citations per year. Mathematical models are probably the worst. Median at 1.9, the highest there is uh, Victor Gers' paper from last year. Neural mass models, the highest is Wilson and Cowan, which most neural mass models start off saying Wilson and Cowan, and uh, from there they, they talk about neural mass models. It's a little, little bit more spread out, but again, the median is pretty low, 2.8. EEG analysis papers are one of the higher ones. So this is more of a uniform distribution. Uh, the two highest are not that much higher than the others. And surprisingly, the review papers don't do all that well. In most, uh, in most subjects, review papers are the highest cited. In this case, it's not true. And if you look at the top three here, two of them aren't even about modeling. So Lopez de Silva's mod uh, modeling review paper from 03 is highly cited. But uh, the rest of these modeling papers, well, review papers just don't get cited very often. Contrast it to the physiology, their median is 5.6. Again, the, these are physiological papers that are cited in a paper about modeling, so I don't know how much, that, uh, how much we can rely on that. So looking at all of these together, uh, since we're talking about things on a medical field, you need to put in bar graph, uh, and they like to put in stars too. So we've now got bar graphs and stars. And the lowest is uh, math and neural mass models. Quantitative EEG actually does very well. Uh, this list, I think, is probably the most interesting. I, I guess uh, I can make this list available to anybody that wants it. But going through, where are each of these types of papers published? So detailed journals, uh, the journals that accept the detailed models. This is a list of them. Um, Looking through, there are some pretty high-end journals in here. Um, yeah? There are quite a few uh, journals in physics that, brought, that publishes modeling in, in physiology. Uh, they weren't cited in this. I'm just going by this one paper. So this is, this is Fabrice's paper. The, math, the journals that, that uh, were cited for math, mathematical models, Different set of journals, some of them are showing up in both. Uh, going to the neural mass models, this, this is the one that's the most different from the others. There's a lot of uh, more physics style journals. And biological cybernetics uh, shows up on this list only. Quantitative EEG journals, these are now the more clinical ones. Physiology journals are spread out over physiological journals, as you'd expect. And then the review journals are kind of a mix of the highest uh, in neuron, progress in neurobiology, and then some other uh, just review journals that shows up. So why would we want to be modeling? We would like to explain these unexplainable phenomena. We'd like to perform the unperformable experiments. Uh, we get novel insights, and we can make lots of data at a time. And it's just fun. You know, those of us that like modeling, it is, it is a lot of fun. But we've got to be able to publish it, and we've got to get, get it accepted. So you're telling me there's a chance. So some of you may not recognize that movie. It's not a great movie, but. So just a couple of anecdotes to finish up of some very successful models. 
So thinking about detailed models, the first name that comes to my mind, and uh, there's several other examples too, is, is Roger Traub. And he made a career and may have started the career of modeling epilepsy. Uh, if you look at his papers, his papers have a lot of interesting co-authors. His papers have lots of physiology co-authors. And his, what he did with these detailed models is he validated every parameter. You go through everything that he's done, he tries to find physiological evidence for that. It makes the models very powerful. And he came up with certain predictions that nobody expected. And some of those predictions have been very hard for him to validate. The neural mass models talked about before also, Fabrice Wendling. He has been very successful with his one model. It's basically been the same model that he's built for about 20 years now. And he collaborates with human and animal physiologists and matches his, he tries to explain the shape of the output based on kind of the simplest inhibitory and excitatory parameters. On the other end of the spectrum is Victor Gersa, who's done a lot of modeling uh, of different dynamics, and most recently the epileptory that uh, I talked about previously. And uh, I will expose him. He's the one that said, I don't care about the physiology. And he really doesn't. So in this case, he's trying to model something that is a generic dynamic of epilepsy and doesn't want to get muddled down by any specific parameters. As, uh, as we were writing the paper, his constant, he was constantly bringing up Eve Martyr's work, saying, how can we constrain ourselves to one set of parameters when we know that there's an infinite number that might be able to get us to the same result? What, uh, we don't, don't have time to talk about all of the, the predictions of his model, but what made this uh, very powerful model was the fact that he took basic canonical theory of physics dynamics and fit it to a very brief set of data that he had. And when we knew that this model was going to be successful was when he went back to uh, Christophe Bernard, who had given him this tracing here on the bottom, this is a seizure from a mouse, except the tracing that Christoph gave him was uh, AC filtered. So it had no DC component at all. If you can imagine this line here, completely detrended. So Victor had done his entire analysis on these data and he went back to Christoph and said, Christoph, there's something wrong with your data. It's supposed to have a DC shift during the seizure. Christoph said, well, it does, doesn't it? No, it doesn't. He showed him, oh, I'm sorry, I gave you the AC coupled data. And he gave him the actual raw data, and there was the DC shift. And that's when Christoph started thinking, you know, it sounds like he's really onto something here. Because he had predicted something that was actually in the data, but we had false, falsified that data and taken it out. So there are several predictions that were made from uh, this model. I think the most important of them is that seizures are an inherent property of neural networks. We think of epilepsy as a disease when in fact any brain can seize. What epileptor predicts is that there is a bifurcation, a seizure threshold, and our brain exists in a certain spot and if that threshold gets moved down due to epilepsy, or if our brain state gets moved towards a threshold due to something that we've done to the brain, either one of those things can cause a seizure. That uh, model has led to many different uh, aspects of research in, in all of our labs, even though it had nothing to do with physiology. So to finish up, I'd like to just say a bunch of things that uh, I, as a reviewer, don't like about reading papers. So the first thing that comes to mind is that I read a paper or a grant and I cannot understand what they're talking about. Now, if you can't get me to understand it, I'm not the best modeler. I, my brain is split between uh, research and, and clinic stuff. And, but if, if you can't get me to understand it, 
then it's not an acceptable paper or grant. And then uh, the rest of these things, there's a common theme here. So you don't explain why it's physiologically relevant. It doesn't have any physiological relevance. You've contrived some physiological relevance. You haven't validated it experimentally. Or you've gone too specific or too generic, or you've invented a treatment that is pure fantasy. You've got a model that means nothing. You do something, you stop the seizure in that model. I'm not going to be terribly impressed. Again, I told you at the beginning, I don't necessarily believe everything I'm saying. I'm just saying what goes through viewers' minds. So then to finish with the final quote, the hardest reviewers are usually other modelers. Every modeler only likes their model. So to the people in this room, don't throw stones. So be nice, be fair, and be open-minded. We are the ones that have to advocate for other models. Now I will say, Every once in a while, I'm asked to review a paper where the model is really cool. And I have gone to uh, editors and fought for those papers. And that's something that we need to do. So anybody here in this room that reviews a paper about modeling or a grant about modeling, if you think it's good and you don't fight for it, it is not going to make it. I will tell you that, it will not make it. Because we are the ones most likely, there, we're probably the one modeler type person that is on the panel. The rest of the people are probably gonna be more physiological, depending on the journal. And if your response isn't very positive, it's gone. And that happened to one of the papers. So I read a paper I really liked. It had a couple things that needed to be finished, they were minor, and it was rejected. And I actually wrote back to the editor and said, you made a mistake. This is a good paper, and it needs to get put in. And he gave me some answer. Two days later, he wrote back and said, the others have complained, and I looked at the paper, and actually were right. So they got a third reviewer, and the paper went through. We have to advocate for it. Now, there's a lot of papers and grants that aren't good, but this is, and this is something, uh, actually, Dave Graydon suggested to, I don't know if he's in the room right now, said, this is something that you need to do when, when you find stuff that's good, we need to advocate for it. Now these other things, I've just sum, summarized the other, uh, the other advice that I had as well. But for those, that are, for those that are writing journals, keep in mind the white at the top, sorry, and those that are reviewing, keep in mind the stuff at the bottom. And that's all, thanks. All right, there's time for a couple of questions. I just have a, a sort of an indirect question that's just about DC modeling and DC and seizures. What do you think about that? Because there's previous papers that sort of, like physiological studies that talked, talked about seizure change being linked to DC shift, but it didn't seem very mainstream and then so I, I have a lot to say about it that. It seems a bit more mainstream. <laughs> um, I don't know. So, so focal seizures, uh, if you're on the focus, you should see a DC shift. The problem is that human electrodes cannot see a DC shift. Even if you put a, a nice amplifier, so first of all, our amplifiers are almost never DC coupled. So we're washing it out anyway. There are some amplifiers that do it. Uh, the, the fancier amplifiers will, will record DC, but a platinum iridium electrode is essentially incapable of holding DC current. You will see a quick transient, but then it'll, it will uh, go back to where it was before. And what you see during these seizures is you see a transient going up, and then it comes back, detrends itself, and then when the seizure's over, it goes back down which is exactly what you see if you take a platinum iridium electrode and put a step function on it. You see a transient up and then a transient down. So we just don't see these. There are some groups that have looked at DC with different electrodes. You have to use a silver silver chloride electrode or something like that. 
And you can see it. And they're actually good papers, but they're not mainstream. They're not, uh, people don't think about it very often. That's actually something that I think would help us localize these drones that zone. Uh, not just because Victor's model uh, looked for it, but there's, there's lots of papers. There's a, a, f a couple groups. Uh, there's one in, in Seattle, especially, that's published the most on it. But it's just not very well recognized. So, any other questions? All right. So, thanks, Bill. Our next speaker is Andre Peterson from the University of.